take us to an uncomfortable place, a place where our faith is challenged, a place where we see other people worshiping other gods and having other beliefs and believing they are a god and temples all around us. And he asked us one question here in the middle of all of this, who am I to you? God wants to hear your personal declaration that even in the middle of this adversity, you are still God the Christ. me trajo desde Chicago a dejar de saber yo sé que has estado frustrado porque has estado orando pero no has visto nada pero Dios te dice hoy sigue sirviendo sí sigue siendo fiel no no pierdas la esperanza porque a cualquier momento se te puede aparecer el ángel ok a ayúdame a predicar Pablo Pablo nos dice Pablo nos enseña que, que se puede hacer fiel y no ser fructífero pero sabe cuál es la ecuación para eso Gálatas 6, 9 No nos cansemos pues de hacer el bien Porque a su tiempo cegaremos Si no desmayamos Thank you. Hey man, praise the Lord How many are excited on tonight? Amen. I want you to just join me quickly. Uh, let's stand to our feet. I'm still a little old school with that. And let's go straight to the word of God. Just want to get that in our hearts today. Uh, join me in the book of Mark. Mark chapter number three. Book of Mark chapter number three. And I just want to arrest your attention to the first five verses. Mark chapter three. Uh, verses 1 to 5, and as you, as you get there, uh, receive love and greetings from my beautiful wife and my three daughters, uh, Anna, Anaya, Amalia, Alana. Yeah, just, just pray for me. Amen. As they all got A names. My, my, my dog's a girl also, so it's just the Lord is with us, though. Uh, but they do send their loves to us all. And I also got to take a point of personal privilege to greet my covenant brother, Pastor Moses Santana, who's here, his beautiful wife, and all of my family and friends from the Philadelphia area. They came here to be with us on tonight. Mark chapter 3, let's go right into the word of the Lord. How many are excited on tonight to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. And we honor also the pastor of this house. I told those of you who are here in the morning and connected online, he was the first pastor uh, and the last pastor. Let's just get that out there too. The first pastor and the last pastor that when I first started in ministry put me on a Greyhound bus for 22 plus hours from the Midwest all the way to Vineland. We, as a matter of fact, we didn't go straight to Vineland, right, Hector? Let's just, they say confession is good for the soul. They took me to Atlantic City first and then drove me to Vineland when, and, and had the audacity to ask me, what you want to do? I want a bed. That's what I want. I want to sleep. Praise the Lord. Uh, but it was from that moment that the Lord connected us and so many other ministers who we still have great bonds and relationship with them. Because um, since we're talking to young preachers and young leaders and young ministries, it's important that you understand that in the kingdom of God, connections is currency. Okay, in the kingdom of God, connections is currency. There's some platforms that you'll never get into to preach, teach, share just because of your ability. Sometimes it's because of who you're connected to and vice versa. Sometimes you will never get into a place because of who you're connected to. Yeah, it doesn't matter how good you preach, just by association, they will never invite you. Because you could have integrity, but be connected to someone who doesn't, and that shuts doors for you as well. That's just a nugget. That's got nothing to do with my message. All right, Mark chapter 3. If you're there with me, would you shout an amen? amen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation Bible, and it says this way, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. 
Then he turned to his critics and said, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. Once again, he looked around at them angrily and deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. And Jesus went into church and noticed a man who had a bad hand. I want to talk tonight using as a subject, I'm playing with a bad hand. I'm playing with a bad hand. I'm playing with a bad hand. Father, speak to us on tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask you this. And the church says amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm playing with a bad hand. I'm playing with a bad hand. I'm playing with a bad hand. A couple of years ago, I was blessed with the opportunity to be able to sit in a young leaders retreat. Uh, There was young leaders, young pastors, young preachers, and even young worshipers and entrepreneurs from all across the globe. There was not just people from the United States, but there was also some international young ministers and leaders. I was fortunate enough to sit under the teaching on that occasion of different ministers, of different preachers. But there was one man in particular by the name of Tommy Tenney. Tommy Tenney was also there. And he said out of the many things that he spoke, one of the things that sat in my heart from that moment till today is that he, he, he equated or he used the parallel, the analogy Uh, saying that leaders, pastors, preachers, worshipers, we need to have the abilities that athletes have. He said we need to have the abilities that athletes have because athletes have the ability to play while being injured. There's, there's, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories we, we can go through. There's a lot of ESPN analysts right here under the sound of my voice. But there is countless amounts of examples We've seen countless amounts of games. We're in the middle of of postseason for football, and there's a lot of basketball going on. But most of the time, we all know it, there's a championship game, and when it finally finishes, the team wins. All the reports come out about he played with an injury, and he was under the weather, and he had lost someone in his family. But they were so focused on the task at hand that nobody knew what was going on because they knew they had to be committed to the task of working through whatever injury it was that they had and just like athletes us as well leaders pastors preachers we need to develop the ability to be able to lead while we're hurting to be able to preach while we're still hurting now please don't exaggerate that please don't misinterpret that because the moment that your hurting starts to bleed into your leading you need to pause to get yourself together The moment that your preaching starts bleeding and now you're no longer edifying people but you're just preaching from your heart and not from your heart. Then that is the moment when you need to sit down and recollect yourself. But to think that everyone who stands at a platform, everyone who teaches from a pulpit has everything put together is where a lot of us are confused. Because the fact of the matter is that any of us who have been in ministry, any of us who have been in leadership knows that ministry and leadership creates hurt. That we deal with people on a day-to-day basis and all of the things that go on in their lives somehow trickle down into our lives. And even us in our personal lives have so much things going on that if we only taught when we felt good, we would never teach. Let's be honest. If we only preach when we felt like preaching, we would never preach. If, if we only served when we felt like serving, a lot of us would never serve. 
but we have to develop the ability to be able to play while being injured. We, we have to be able to play while we have been dealt a bad hand. This, this, this description, this expression of playing with a bad hand is not just talking about an actual physical injury, but this expression of playing with a bad hand is a card game terminology. See, it was Voltaire, one of the French greatest philosophers and writers who said, each player must accept the cards that life offers to them. But once they are in their hands, only he or she must decide how to play the cards to win the game. This expression of playing with a bad hand is card game terminology. Now, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know nothing about poker. Let's just... Let's just put that out there, yeah? But this expression comes from card games like that. Also, even for those of us who are domino enthusiasts, know what it is to be given a bad hand. And you look at what is in front of you and you say, now how in God's holy name am I going to turn this around? But if you're an expert player, you can be dealt a bad hand and still come out winning. Yeah, if you are good at what you do, you can be dealt a bad hand and still find a way to come out winning in the game this this terminology to receive a bad hand means that you have been dealt a hand or a set of cards that are a guaranteed loss from the start in the game of poker to receive a bad hand is to receive bad cards in the game it means that from the jump from off the bat from the beginning of the game you have been dealt disadvantages that from the beginning of it before you have even started just by look has anyone played card games don't act like you've been saved I know it's someday don't hide behind your religious clothes but have you ever played with the family card games and you just sit down or dominoes and as you look at it you say no this ain't good already this, this is this is bad bad but somehow you still manage to turn it around and walk away from the table as the champion walk away from it as a victor well we need to understand that the same thing is applicable in our lives the same thing is applicable in leadership the same thing applies to ministry sometimes ministry can deal you a bad hand sometimes your assignment doesn't come good from the beginning can you can anyone imagine what it would feel like if from the moment you started ministry you were handed a healthy hand could, could you imagine how life would be if from the moment you started leadership, you started with a healthy hand? But sometimes God likes to put us in a place where it seems like we're at a disadvantage so that we can learn to only depend on him. So that when everything is over and we walk away from the table as a victor, we can only point people to God and say, it wasn't me who was playing, but it was God who was playing through me it it wasn't me who was preaching because if I preached what I really wanted to preach half of y'all wouldn't be here but it was God who was preaching through me it it wasn't me who was leading because I read all the books and still don't understand them but it was God who was leading through me because even when life hands us disadvantages we serve a God who is an expert at playing a bad hand and turning it into something good Get over here, Paul. Help me preach to Transformation Church. He said, and all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. See, it's inevitable that when you play the game of life, you'll occasionally be dealt a bad hand. But as a real winner knows, your experience of life will come down to how you play the hand that you have been dealt. Poker players sometimes emerge victorious when they have terrible cards because of their ability to maintain composure, otherwise known as a poker face. It, it isn't just the hand that 
that you have been dealt. It is the composure of your character to know I got a lot of bad things on my plate, but no one will ever see me cry. I got a lot of things going on, but no one will ever see me break. I got a lot of things on my mind, but I'm going to put myself together before I walk into that church because there are people that are depending on my anointing. Would you help me elbow somebody and say, keep your composure. Keep keep your composure. Don't, don't let nobody see you broken because God is walking with you. Problems are a part of the human experience, but handled the right way. Our biggest problems often end up in our biggest blessings. <laughs> uh, problems are a part of the human experience but if they're handled the right way your biggest problem your biggest challenge your biggest opposition your biggest thing in front of you can end up becoming the biggest blessing in disguise you have to understand that sometimes bad things can happen to good people sometimes those of us who live by faith will often have a crisis crisis of faith but if we persevere if we keep our composure if we trust in God we will be able to see the other side of the bad hand that life has dealt us that's what we see in the story before us we see that when Jesus walks into the synagogue when we when we find Jesus in our text he's walking into the church and when he gets there, the first thing he encounters is that he sees a man with a messed up hand. Now, before I dive into that, I need to give you context so you could appreciate the content from chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 6 that we have read. We are seeing a build up, a build up of an inevitable confrontation. Jesus was not the passive Jesus that a lot of y'all like. Jesus was confident confrontational to his fiber he would walk into church with the purpose of messing up whatever those religious leaders were teaching Jesus would walk he never had a problem with sinners he was at a wedding and he was cool he was in a party and he was safe but every time he walked into church he said what could I stir up what what could I turn over what could I grab from the things that they're teaching and teach it the right way Jesus was confrontational and I got a problem with a lot of you soft saints that want to fly under the radar and don't want no one to do anything to you because the God that I serve doesn't always come to bring peace. The God that I serve sometimes needs to be a little confrontational. The God that we serve knows how to be loving, but he also knows how to check you when you are out of your box. He knows how to put you back in your place when you have have lost your focus Jesus showed up in the book of Mark to be confrontational the religious leaders were following him and they were getting tired of him but he was getting tired of them they were following him to see what it was he was going to do. They, the religious leaders, were getting tired of Jesus humiliating them because the problem wasn't what he was teaching. The problem was that he would continually back up what he was teaching. <laughs> I don't got time to go down that road. He, it wasn't just that he was talking about healing. It's the fact that he was actually healing. Good God. Uh, all right, look at me because I'm talking to the next preachers I'm talking to the next prophets God don't care so much about how good you sound God wants to know do you have signs that can back up how you sound the problem that the world has with the church is that we no longer have the substance for the things we talk about Nah, the problem with the problem with the people, if you haven't noticed in the middle of the pandemic, people had a problem with church because all of us were always preaching about healing, but nobody was walking into a COVID infested hospital to lay hands on nobody. 
We were too caught up in viruses and vaccines and mass mandates and everything else that nobody was saying, bring the sick to me. Good God. Y'all awfully quiet in this Methodist church now. God was looking for people that would say something and say, no, I'm not just having a sound, but I also got signs to back up everything that I'm preaching. The worst part, the worst part that was happening was that it wasn't only what he was teaching. It was that he was continually backing up his claims with acts of undeniable power. Teaching the inerrant authority that he possessed. And the hostility starts getting to its climax in what Mark shows to us as the fifth controversy. Resulting in anger from both sides. Jesus' anger was stemmed from the religious leaders placing limits on what was right and what was good. For the Pharisees, their anger was over a young rabbi who continued to undermine their traditions. A young preacher who continued to break their religious rules. A little renegade who continued to throw over the status quo. That was their problem. And so because they were so outraged, they they started to follow him and plot how they could destroy him. The thing about Jesus is that Jesus would not back off. Jesus would not move away. Jesus continued to teach, though he understood where it would lead, though he understood what would happen to him. He was consumed with the will of his father. He was emboldened by an uncompromising conviction. He he was moving ahead, knowing that ultimately he would face the cross, but he was convinced, I'm going to do the will of my father. I'm going to do what is right and what is good. Can I tell you that doing good for the glory of God will always invite critical scrutiny. Yeah, I'll say that again, that that every time you determine in your heart, in your mind, I'm going to do good for the glory of God. That is inviting critical scrutiny. That is putting your life under a microscope. Every time you say, I want to do this good, I want to do this right, and I want to do it for the glory of God, your acceptance of your call is also an invitation for critical scrutiny. For Jesus, doing good for the glory of God was not restricted to date or location. This encounter occurred in a synagogue, in the house of worship, and it was also on the Sabbath. Jesus has just violated their religious sensibilities by allowing the disciples to pluck some grain. The Pharisees considered work on the Sabbath as a heinous offense to the Sabbath. It seemed like Jesus was deliberately provoking confrontation with them. It's almost as he was inviting them to criticize and fight him. Because they kept telling him, don't claim to forgive sins. Don't sit down with sinners. Don't neglect fasting like we're dictating. Don't work in order to eat on the Sabbath. But the hardness of their heart was so overwhelming that Jesus was getting frustrated and he was reaching a boiling point. Undoubtedly, it was almost like he wanted to challenge them. He said, let me meet them in their playground and let me challenge everything they know And they believe. So he shows up to the synagogue. He specifically picks that place and that day. And when he gets there, the Bible says that the first thing he's greeted with is a man with a withered hand. In the synagogue, he sees a man with a withered hand. See, this story teaches us that if we're really going to do the will of God, then we need to have enough anointing to be sensitive to those who need compassion. 
That if we really want to walk in the call of God for our life, God wants us to be sensitive to those who need compassion. He was in the synagogue and he sees a man with a withered hand and this man was disabled and he was in need of love and compassion. Can you just imagine the repeated amounts of times of embarrassment this man had to endure every time he showed up to the synagogue for the time of prayer as it was a custom and he had to lift up his rod, his dry, withered, raggedy hands up. Can you imagine the embarrassment when everybody was looking at him and everyone walked away but nobody was having compassion for him. You can draw the conclusion that his deformed hand was probably a curse from God for the sin of his or the sin of his parents because the way that they taught in the Bible was that if somebody was sick, sickness came from sin. Sickness came from sin. John chapter 9, the disciples find a blind man and they ask Jesus the pivotal question. They say, who sinned, him or his parents, for him to be like this? Because they thought that if you were sick, it's because there was some sort of hidden sin in your life. But Jesus said, no, he is like this only so that God could be glorified. Can I tell someone that there are some things that God will allow in our life? There are some disadvantages that will come our way that God will allow for the purpose of bringing glory to his name. It was not a curse. It is not a disadvantage. It is not that you are broken on purpose it is that God wants to use that to bring glory to his name and there are some things in our life that may be happening right now and we try to keep it hidden from everybody but God says the only way I can bring glory to my name is if you exhibit the things that you're going through don't just talk about your strength but be honest about your weaknesses because in your weakness is where I am made strong so he gets there and this blind man needed this this withered hand man needed as much attention as the blind man and he was there on the right time so that God's power could be put on display see Jesus had authentic anointing to be sensible he was sensible to what was going on in church he was, he was sensible to what was happening in the atmosphere. He, he was sensible. I, I, I'm about to go into, into Apache territory, but I, I got a personal problem with preachers who show up 45 minutes after service has started. Yeah, I, I got a pro. I came. I came to impart into you. I got a problem. Listen to me, school of the spirit. I have a problem with you being God's man or God's woman. You have a supposed word for the people, but you get there thirty minutes after the people have already started worship. Cause how could you read the atmosphere? How could you be sensible to the need? How could you bring me a thus say of the Lord if you were not in the same place that worship? was being given to God if you were not in the same place of the people who you're trying to preach to a preacher with no worship is an entertainer with a microphone if, if all you do is make noise when you have a microphone you're not a preacher you're just an entertainer he showed up and started reading the atmosphere and when he got there, he noticed there's a man with a crippled hand. When he gets in the synagogue, there's a man with a deformed hand. He gets to the church and he sees that the problem was not outside of the church. The problem was inside of the church. Can we, can we be honest for just a minute? Can we, can we be honest for just a minute? The, the reality is that there is more problems in the church than there is outside of the church. Yeah, yeah, I know we come to church and we hide behind our favorite worship songs and we sit in our favorite seats so that no one can know what's going on. But there's a lot of issues going on inside of here because if God didn't cover you with his grace, you would be like everybody outside 
outside of the church. But the fact of the matter is we come into the house of God and we try to cover ourselves with his grace and act like we're holier than thou when the reality is that the church is for problematic people. Hmm. He shows up and when he gets to the church, he sees there's a man with the withered hand. When he gets there, he sees the man with the dry hand. See, people with physical disabilities were generally excluded from the community because a deformity was considered an indication of sin. But this man did not care about opinions. This man didn't care about what the law said. This man did not care about being excluded from the community. He knew the only one who could heal me from this was God. The only one who could break me out of this. The only one who could deliver me from this. The only one who could restore me from this was God. The Bible says that he had a withered hand. I like this because withered describes a condition of paralysis. It describes a condition of deformity due to an accident, due to disease, or due to a birth defect. Please don't miss it. It says that the man had a withered hand. The version we read said that he had a deformed hand. And this tells us that he had this condition of paralysis or deformity because of an accident, because of a disease, or because of a birth defect. But can I teach you something? The New International Version gives us a little bit more details. Yeah, yeah, because the New International Version says not that he had a withered hand, not that he had a deformed hand. It said that he had a shriveled hand. He had a shriveled hand. And when you look up the word shriveled, it talks about atrophy. Atrophy is the deterioration or the decrease in the size of an organ. And that starts to decrease and it starts to mess up due to a lack of usage. Okay, I, I, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. The Bible says that this man was there with a withered hand, with a deformed hand, with a shriveled hand. He had atrophy in his hand. That meant that his hand was drying up because of lack of usage. And can I tell you that there's a lot of us in church that we are drying up. We are going through a dry season because we are not using the things that God has given given to us. A lot of us our ministry is drying up. Our gift is drying up. Our leadership is shriveling up because we have placed in a hiding spot the things that God has given to us. You know you're supposed to be preaching but you're not preaching like you're supposed to. You know God has called you to worship but you are not worshiping like you are supposed to. The man had a shriveled hand because he was not using the hand and as he was supposed to and because he was not using that hand the hand was drying up on him and a lot of us are in the season of our life where our life is drying up before us because the thing that God has given to you you are not using it like you are supposed to and because you're not using it as you're supposed to you're going into a dry season but I came today to talk to some of you under the sound of my voice and let you know God wants you to pick it back up again. Whatever it is that you used to do, that you stopped doing, it is time to go back to it again. The, the book you stopped writing, it's time to go back to it. The song you did not finish, it's time to go back to it again. The business you did not finish starting, it's time to go back to it again because there are people assigned to you. But because he wasn't using it, his hand was drying up. He wasn't, he wasn't practicing anymore. He, he wasn't doing anything with it. And, 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 and it was drying up. 
I was a barber for many years. Pastor Hector knows this. And, and I stopped being a barber because I started traveling in ministry. And, and, and when, when, when my brother started growing up and, and we were going through a situation in the family that money was tight, my dad said, why don't you cut their hair? I said, I don't know if I could do it anymore because since I have not been using the motion of my hand to particularly do this thing, I don't know if I could do it. They might want to taper and they may come out with no hair on their head because I, I have not done it before practice makes perfect and, and the more that you do it your body gets used to doing it it, it becomes second nature to you the, the same movements the same exercises the same mobility but the moment you stop doing it it becomes hard for you again that's, that's why a lot of us we walked away from church because of X Y and Z experiences and now that we're back again it's hard for us to get into the rhythm of it because we stopped doing it for so long that, that it is no longer in our second nature but can I tell you that Jesus showed up to that place to be able to restore that man's mobility again he showed up to that place to be able to help him with the dry season and bring back the mobility to his hand once again the passage of Mark, it's also stated in Matthew and in Luke because the Gospels are synoptic. That means they tell the same story from a different perspective. And it's interesting because Luke, who was a doctor, being a doctor, gives us his medical professional experience. Yeah, yeah, because Luke does not just tell us that he had a withered hand. Luke gives us detail when he does his autopsy of this man. He says the withered hand was the right hand. Yeah, yeah, this, this is important. This is important. See, because in the Bible, the right hand was used, it was used in specific forms depending on the context in which it was described. As example, in the book of Genesis chapter 48, the right hand is a place of distinction and favor. In the book of Ecclesiastics, the right hand is a place of wisdom. In, in the book of Samuel, the right hand is a place of direction. In, in the book of Kings, the right hand is a place of honor. In the book of Psalms, the right hand is used for holding your weapon. And in the book of Ezekiel, the right hand was given as a sign of submission. In the book of Matthew, the right hand is a place of power. And when you mention the left and the right hand, it talks about intimacy. So when the Bible tells us that it was his right hand Hand that was deformed it means that life had stripped him of his favor of his wisdom of his direction of his honor of his control of his intimacy of his power but the bible says that even though he had been stripped of all of that he went to the place where we could get it all back again this is what's powerful about the man what's powerful about this man is that your Bible says that the man was there with a withered hand. No, you missed it. Look at me again. The Bible says that the man was there with a withered hand. Okay? You lost it. Get over here. The man was there with a withered hand. All right. Uh, Adam Clark, theologian, he put it this way. The man's hand was dry, but God's mercy had still preserved his mind and his feet so that he could still bring it to the place of worship where Jesus would find him and still heal him. See, a lot of us, we use our problems as an excuse to stop coming to God. We, we like to use our deformities as an excuse as to how God can use you. The man said, my hands don't work, but my mind is still fine and, and my feet are still working. And if those are working, then I can still come to him and give him glory some of y'all haven't been saved all your life but when i was in my little pentecostal spanish storefront church they used to sing i feel them in my hands and i feel them in my feet and when i can't use my hands i'll use my voice and when i can't use my voice i'll use my heart and if i can't use my heart it's because i went to be with him 
His hands was withered, but his feet was working. <laughs> his hands were withered, but his feet was working. His hands were withered, but his mind was still working. And a lot of us like to look at what's wrong with us and don't pay attention to what's still working on us. A lot of us only focus on what's wrong with us. And we miss what is still working with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. A, a lot of us look at, at the fact that we don't have the connections, at the fact that we don't have the credentials, at the fact that we don't come from a good family. We, we look at everything that's wrong with us and we want to disqualify us. When God says, I see what's wrong with you, but I also see what still works in you. And, and you can use what works until I heal what's wrong. Uh, I, I, I gotta go I gotta go he, he said I, I know I know I got a withered hand but my feet still work and because that is still working I can still come to the house of God uh, the problem with the passage the problem with the passage is not just that the man was at the synagogue with a withered hand the problem with the passage is that the day that Jesus showed up was the Sabbath it was on the Sabbath that Jesus came to the synagogue. And there was a man with a withered hand. And it, it immediately created a buzz. It immediately created a stir. When the Pharisees saw him walk in the synagogue and everyone saw Jesus and the man with the withered hand and they started watching to see what would happen. See, because according to the interpretation of the law, it was illegal to heal a person on the Sabbath. But Jesus had showed up there to prove to them that he was the God of the Sabbath. He had showed up to prove to them that God's healing hand is not limited to a location and to a date. But when God wants to heal someone, he could heal them wherever and heal them whenever. But when God has selected you to be a renegade, when God has called you to work your call in this time, you have to be ready for those who are always going to criticize you. The Pharisees and the scribes were there. I like Dr. Luke, Pastor Mo, because Dr. Luke doesn't even describe who they are. He calls them them. Mark says the Pharisees. Matthew says the scribes, but Luke says they, they don't even deserve worship. They don't even deserve credit. They, they don't even deserve attention. As a matter of fact, he says in the book of Luke, they were in worship, but they were watching. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he says they were in worship, but they were watching. They, they were in the house of God, but they were not worshiping God. They were watching God. Y'all missing it. Get over here. They were in worship, but they were not worshiping. They were watching. Come here. The worshiper was withered, but the religious people had rigor mortis. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The worshiper was withered, but the pastor had rigor mortis. He he was inflexible. He was stiff. He he was tense. He was he was so cut off that he could not realize God is in the house, and I'm just watching. They were in worship, but they were watching. I like it. I like it because. The term to watch in Mark, the Greek gives us a connotation of plotting, of spying, of stalking, of scheming. <laughs> so they weren't even there watching with good intentions. 
good God. I'm talking to someone under the sound of my voice. Can I be honest with you? There's some people that come to church with you and they're here watching and, and they may be looking at you with their eyes but their heart is conniving against you because they are waiting for you to slip up. They're, they're waiting for you to make a mistake so they can walk into Pastor Hector's office and say, I told you you shouldn't have given them a chance. I, I told you you shouldn't have anointed them but can I tell you something? They could sit back and scheme and watch until their hair gets gray and white but the word of God says I've never seen the just forsaken he says they were watching they were plotting it's the same term that David used in Psalms 37 when he said the wicked plot against the just and they gnash their teeth at him but the Lord laughs at the wicked for he knows that their day is coming see when you have a legalistic spirit, you become critical of everything. You're always on the lookout for what is wrong. And you seldom can realize what is actually right. You're so caught up in what is going on that you miss what God is doing. You get so caught up in keeping to your own tradition, to your own agenda, to your own plans, to your own desire, then most of the time you miss God and his move. The Pharisees, they are eyeballing Jesus and they're watching him, waiting to see if he messes up. Waiting to see. They were continuing to watch because they wanted to see what he would do. Here's the funny thing, Pastor Jeffrey, that, that the Sabbath day had its own set of rules. There was even, Pastor Hector, there was even something called the Sabbath day journey, which meant that if it was the Sabbath day, they needed to count the amount of steps that they took so that they weren't walking more than they should on the Sabbath day. And, and R.C. Sproul suggests that they were following Jesus so much that day that they missed counting their Sabbath day steps. You, 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 you just lost it. You, that they were watching Jesus. They were plotting against Jesus. They were spying on Jesus to see if he would violate the law when they didn't realize they themselves were violating the law. He said, is it legal? Because if you really consult your Mosaic law, he was telling the Pharisees, I want you to examine your traditions because a lot of the things that you say is in God's law is not in his law. I want you to examine your tradition regarding the Sabbath to see if it is consistent with what God wants us to do. Because Jesus was telling them the last time that I checked, he wanted us to show compassion and wanted us to show mercy and he did not care what day of the week it was but for us to extend mercy to everybody so Jesus posed the question because he wanted to make their motives clear and evident can I help you every time Jesus or God in the Bible asks a question it's rhetorical he's asking but he already knows the answer the purpose of the question is to reveal your heart. The purpose of the question is to reveal your intentions. The purpose of, of the question is to make your motive clear and evident. The obvious answer was failing to do good and save a life would actually be violating the law. But the Bible says that when he asked them the question, I'm getting ready to close, they, they just stared at him. They remained silent. They were unrepentant. Their hearts were hardened. Verse 5 of this chapter says that he stared at them. The gospel of Mark is so interesting because it teaches us Jesus as a person. The gospel of Mark narrates with greater transparency the feelings of Jesus. 
If you want to see what Hebrews tells us about having a high priest who is not out of touch with our reality, then follow Jesus through Mark. Because in the book of Mark, you'll see him get mad. In the book of Mark, you'll see him cry. In the book of Mark, you'll see Jesus show his transparency and feelings. And in this text, the self-justification of the religious leaders through their silence and their supposed superiority was only angering Jesus. Jesus was angered by their indifference. Jesus was angered by their hard hearts. See, this teaches us that anger is not bad in it and of itself. I just lost half of y'all. Anger is not bad in it and of itself. It is how we express our anger. Okay, I I lost you. Come here. The Bible says, get angry, but don't sin. Because anger is not the problem. It is how you express your anger. Yeah. See, Jesus expressed his anger. Watch me correcting the problem. A lot of us express our anger criticizing the problem. In other words, Jesus said, if you're not going to fix it, don't say anything. If you're not going to heal it, don't look at it. If if you're not going to help them, don't talk about them. But but Jesus said, if I'm getting angry, it's because I want to do something about it. But the tension in the text was that Jesus' philosophy was the human need always prevails the law. But he also knew that he had come to abolish it by fulfilling it. So he said, I want to heal him without breaking the law. I want to heal him, but I can't touch him. Because I need to heal him, but I also got to fulfill the law. So what does Jesus do? He creates a win-win solution. He says, I'll heal him without putting my hands on him. I just lost you. He, he said, he said I, I need to heal him, but it's the Sabbath day. And I know that if I heal him, they're going to criticize me. But I don't want to give them evidence to criticize me because I didn't come to just abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So he said, how could I help him? I'm going to heal him without putting my hands on him. So verse 3, it says that he calls him forward. I love this because if you run through all of the versions, the Nasab Bible says, get up and come forward. The King James says, step forward. The NIV says, stand in front of everyone. The Message Bible says, stand where we can see you. In other words, Jesus literally wanted everybody to see his condition. Why? Because God cannot heal what you keep hiding. He said healing can only come if you expose it. Uh, I, I, got, I got three girls, right? You know, they're, they're, they're reckless, God help me. They, they run around, they, they hurt themselves. They, I, I swear I got three boys at home because they wrestle and fight more than anything in the world. And sometimes they cut themselves, right? Sometimes they get a boo-boo, they get an accident. And just recently, my middle child, she cut herself in her arm. I said, okay, we're going to cover it up for a little bit. But when you go to sleep, I need you to take the band-aid off. She said, why? I'm going to bleed everywhere. I said, no, you're not. The air around you will dry up the wound. But as you expose it, it heals faster. She said, what you mean? I said, yeah, if you keep the band-aid on, then it'll scar and scab, and there'll be a mark of what happened to you. But if you remove the band-aid and expose it, it'll heal naturally as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, get on over here. Jesus told him, I need you to stop hiding in the back of the church, and I need you to be honest with me, because grace is not for the hidden grace is for the exposed grace is not for those who think they got it together grace is for the ones that say look I done messed up I drank I slept I did it it's me but I'm being honest it's me standing in the need of prayer he 
Tell them, get up here so everyone can see you. And watch how he said, I'm getting ready to go. You can stand if you want. He said, watch how I'm going to heal you. Ready for this? I'm going to heal you by asking you to do what you can't do. Next, he says, take your withered hand and stretch it out. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes the only thing you need is for God to encourage you to do what you thought was impossible. He, he said, I know you think that you can't do it, but I came to let you know, take that dry, shriveled hair and stretch it out because your healing comes in your stretching. When I stretch you, that's when you're healed. But if you keep hiding back there, I can't heal you. I need, I need you to come out into the open. I need everybody to know what's going on with you. I, I got to get out your way, but please don't, don't, don't sit down. The widow came to the prophet and she said, my husband was a man of God. He served you. He loved us, but he was bad managing our finances we got a debt he's dead and they're coming to get our boys and I, and I, and I, I need you to do something he said here's what you're going to do you're going to knock on everybody's door and you're going to tell them can I borrow some vases pause she's in the problem because her husband borrowed and now God is telling her go let everybody know I know we're in debt because of him and it's going to sound crazy but now I'm taking out a loan but if you could be honest with yourself and admit to the problem then I can do the miracle y'all look lost she had to knock on everybody's door and say can I borrow a vase and if she lived in a Hispanic community they weren't just going to give a vase without knowing what it was for Follow me in the house while I get this vase and tell me why I'm giving it to you. And she had to give him the rundown. My husband died. We got a debt. And I got to loan this vase because the prophet told me God's going to do a miracle. She's in the problem because she borrowed. And God's going to get her out by borrowing. Shh. Yeah, yeah, this, this man, this man was there because he had a dry hand. And now God was telling him, I'm going to use that same hand to heal you with it. If you only believe me and stretch it out. He told him to reach out his hand. And it was restored just like the other. It was restored. The word restored doesn't just mean to put back the word restore in Greek means to bring you to your original state see a lot of us got the idea of restoration wrong we think restoration is to pick you up restoration is to put you back you lost it restoration isn't me picking you up restoration is me putting you back what was it that you were doing before you fell because I gotta get you back to that place but this time better but this time stronger but this time more anointed when he looked at his right hand and he looked at his left hand he couldn't tell the difference because God didn't just heal him God restored it to his original state was no residue he was healed with no scars he was delivered and no evidence because if there was evidence then the Pharisees could accuse Jesus but because he healed him with no evidence they couldn't accuse him of doing a miracle but he could confess that he had been healed a lot of us under the sound of my voice and I'm out your way life can deal us some bad hands it doesn't matter how many times you confess this is my year sometimes it just doesn't become your year it doesn't matter how many times you say it 
you, you can quote scripture until Jesus comes. But sometimes life has the tendency to deal you a bad hand. It's what you do with it. It's how you play it. Can I go a little further? It's whose hands you put it in. Yeah. Because in my hands, in my hands, a basketball costs $12.99. In LeBron James' hands, it costs $60 million. In my hands, a camera just costs $200. In the hands of a man like Daniel Schiffer, it costs 1.7 million. Because it is not what I have in my hands. It's in whose hands I give it to. In my hands, it's a bad deck of cards. In God's hands, he can turn it around for your good. <laughs> Nehemiah was dealt a bad hand. God said, I'm calling you to ministry. Awesome, where are we going? You're going to ruins. And he walked around the ruins and said, let me give this back to God. What is your plan for this? And what would have took them years to do, they rebuilded it in months. Because it's not what you have in your hands. It's in whose hands you put it. In your hands is probably just one or two sermons. In God's hands, it's thousands of lives. In your hands, it's probably just three chords. Do, re, fa. In God's hands, that's the sound of heaven. It's not what you have. It's in whose hands you place it in. Would you close your eyes all over this room, standing to your feet if you're not already standing? I need to open this altar tonight. My worship team would join me up here, please. Because tonight, as a part of the soul's night, we're getting ready to open the altar for a time of prayer and a time of impartation. You're here on assignment. You didn't just accept it because the pastor told you about it. But it was something in your heart that God was speaking to you about. And so on today, I open up this altar. Because there's some things in our life that we need God to heal first. There's some things in our life that if we're going to be able to continue, we need to give it over to Him. We got to be honest and say, Lord, I've been coming to the house. I've been coming to worship, but I haven't been involved in it because I've been caught up in what's wrong and that I'm missing what you're doing. I'm caught up in what's wrong that I'm missing what's working. There's a lot of us that have atrophy. There's a lot of us who are withered worshipers withered preachers withered intercessors there's a dry season in our life and the only one who could bring restoration is God some of us have leaned into the legalistic critical spirit of the Pharisees and you are missing God moments because you're so caught up in your tradition, in your agenda, in doing things right. You're missing what God is trying to do. Don't let religion push you into rigor mortis. Where you're so tense, so indifferent, so inflexible that you miss a move of God. Tonight we open the altar. And I would ask that every one of us, every student that is here that needs prayer and impartation, that wants to end this night in the presence of God, 
giving up and over to him. Whatever you feel you still are holding on to. Whatever limitation you've placed on yourself, emotional, spiritual, mental, whatever it may be, tonight is the night where God is telling you as he told that man, come and stand here and stretch yourself out. Because as you stretch yourself, God will begin to heal and restore the things that are still wrong in your life so that you can be back to where he has called you to be. If that's you, I want you to meet me here now. Would you join me as our worship team gets ready to take us into the presence of the Lord? I want you to join me at this altar. This is the time that you got to be honest with yourself and say, Lord, I know what's holding me back. You know what's holding me back. You know what I'm hiding. You know what I'm keeping. But today, today I want you to heal me completely. I want, I want to be made whole. I don't want to keep going through life as usual. I want something different want something real I want to be honest with you and transparent about how I feel and no longer let life limit me that whatever has been dealt my way I can give it to you the dysfunction of my family the place I was brought out of the experiences that I lived at our early childhood whatever it is God says you can give it over to me and I can use it for my glory if that's you join me here at this altar you can take a place you can take a, a spot you can kneel if you want to kneel but I'm getting ready to lay hands on whomever I ask Pastor Hector to join me, Pastor Mo would you be so kind, Pastor Jeffrey would you join me over here this school of the spirit we want you to be different ministers different pastors we, I, I'm, I'm tired of the same thing I scroll through social media and every preacher looks the same they sound the same they, they, they talk the same as if God isn't different God can't bless who you pretend to be can only bless the authentic you so we don't want you to get caught up in the platforms and the lights and, and the public the applauses the recognition Jesus cared about none of that he wanted to show compassion he wanted to be where God called him to be at the time that God called him to be there Every time Jesus spoke, taught, healed, whatever it was, he said, I'm just doing what my Father sent me to do. I pray that you would leave this place saying, I just want to do what my Father called me to do. If that's you in this altar, would you close your eyes and lift both of your hands up? I promise it's, it's not a stick up, it's a surrender. Would you lift up your hands, please, right where you are? Lift your hands. And I'm going to give you about 45 seconds just to take a moment to be honest. Remove every layer of religiosity that you have. Everything that you have covered up as if God can't already see the real you. And tell him today, Lord, I've been playing with a bad hand, but today I want you to heal me and make me whole. Restore me to my original state. Help me.
to look at my limitations and still believe that you can use me for your glory. That whatever is wrong in my life, I not give it too much attention and just use what is working still. Would you do that, please? As my sister gets ready to worship the Lord, I want to give you 45 seconds for you to open your heart and your mouth and begin to talk with God right where you are. That you would pray, that you would cry out. Before we lay hands, before we come by you, this is a moment between you and God. Just talk with him right where you are. Come on. Come on, talk with him.